faced them with strength, courage, and endurance. I had to, I had to get stronger and become mentally awake. At first, I wasn't optimistic. Then I slowly began to realize that if I wanted to succeed, I had to give it all I had. My heart was anxious to get in the game, and through the test of time, I finally did. The Bible gives us several examples of men who, had, who were courageous. In Joshua chapter 1, we are told that God's servant, Joshua, also faced a daunting challenge. After the children of Israel had finally made it to the border of Canaan, they were told some devastating news. The famous leader Moses wasn't going with them into the promised land. After Moses died, the Lord spoke to Joshua, Moses' assistant, and said that he would lead the people into the battle against the Canaanites. The Bible says that Joshua was told four times by the Lord to be strong and courageous. And through the test of time, Joshua and the Israelites endured. Another example is found in 1 Samuel chapter 17. It is here that the Bible tells of Israel's engagement with the mighty Goliath. Goliath was strong and courageous, a man greatly feared. Who would, fa who would face this awesome being? Young David, the shepherd boy, accepted the challenge. King Saul told David that he wasn't ready for such an awesome task. However, David exceeded the expectation. David courageously accepted mighty Goliath with a sling and stone, and he slew the giant. David found confidence within himself and God, and as a result, David succeeded. So how did, these, how did these men triumph over such odds? They put their trust in God and made the decision to take action. They calculated the steps for success. They faced the uncertainty with courage and the difficulties with strength. With God on their side, they succeeded. And with God on our side, we will too. Thank you. studying from uh, Ephesians this morning. If you do not have one of our study guides, uh, we've got a few left. Uh, Brother Rick Warner has got two or three extras back there. If you'll just hold up your hand, he'll cover that. If we need to get some more, we'll print a few more. There are many in our bulletin and that we've heard of that are in need of our prayers. I'm going to start with with deaths in the general area. Uh, Jimmy C. Sorrell family needs to be remembered in our prayers. Uh, listed in the bulletin is the Reed family. There's the death of an infant. And these are friends of the Dale Kendrick family. And then uh, also listed in the bulletin, family is extended to the family of Keita Stevens, who passed away last week. She is Dale Kendrick's first cousin and the daughter of the late Cleopas and uh, Maddie Stevens, who were longtime members here. And then many of you know that Brother Raver Stevens had a four wheeler accident. He is in the Magnolia Hospital and had let us know this morning he had a very bad night and asked that we remember him in, in prayer. Laverne Coker is at home. Uh, short visits are welcome. We're so glad that Sister Paula Warner is able to be with us this morning. Uh, Margaret Lauderdale, that's Emma and Parker Pageant's grandmother, is in ICU in Baptist East in Memphis. Brittany Graves Smith is in critical condition in the Magnolia Hospital. That's a close friend of David and Lisa Horn. Uh, Lyle Bullock is recently diagnosed with uh, cancer. He's a good friend of Gerald and Pat Gray. And uh, Faye McAlphin is a member at, the, at Foot Street and is in the hospital in Birmingham. And also uh, Kevin Wilcutt is at home recovering from surgery. Are there others that we need to be remembering in prayer?
Was that Connie Rakestraw? Sonny? Would you bow with me, please? Our loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can assemble this morning to study your word, and we pray your blessings to be upon us in this class. Uh, we pray, Father, for the families who have had deaths. We play, pray for the family of Jimmy C. Sorrell, the Reed family, the Keita Stevens family. We, we pray for Sonny uh, Rakestraw, for uh, Raver Stevens, Laverne Coker, Paula Warner, June Cupper, uh, Joel Cupper, uh, Margaret Lauderdale, uh, Brittany Graves Smith, Lyle Bullock, Faye McAlphin, uh, for Kevin Wilcutt, and Father, for others who are undergoing treatment. Uh, we, we know that you're the great physician and you're all wise, and we pray that you would render unto these the needs that are theirs. Father, we ask that you bless our country during this, especially during this time of election. We, we pray that those who uh, oppose you would be defeated and those who support you would be elected. We love you, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. There are several gospel meetings this week. Uh, I think... Uh, Golden Circle, or the, we're going to run a bus. You don't have to be in Golden Circle. If you'd like to go to Ripley, we're going to be leaving about 6 o'clock from the annex uh, tomorrow night going to Ripley. See if I can make our clicker work here. How about hitting, hit, hitting the index button for me up there? All right. When you look at Ephesians, the um, and some of this is in your study guide, and some of it's not. So I'm going to just uh, go with you on that. If you look at the first verse and of chapter one and the first verse of chapter three, in Ephesians one one, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Christ Jesus, and also. In Ephesians 3 and verse 1, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. Early uh, sources in church history that attributed this letter to Paul included writings from the year 200 and 250 and 150. You can see some of those early uh, church historians that attributed that to Paul. When you think about the recipients, there are reasons to believe that this epistle was not designated or designed for just one congregation, but intended to be passed around several churches in the area surrounding Ephesus. The earliest manuscripts do not contain the phrase in Ephesus. There are three older manuscripts in particular that had a blank there. And I'll comment a little bit more about that in just a moment. You know, there, when you look at the New King James rendering and the King James rendering, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Uh, the epistle itself is in the form of a general treatise rather than a letter written to a specific church, or at least that seems to be the the flow compared to other writings of Paul. For example, there are no specific exhortations or personal greetings. It is thought by some, and there are a couple listed there, that this letter is the epistle that was first sent to Laodicea that we studied about in Colossians 4.16 and designed to be shared with other churches including Ephesus. I personally disagree with that thought because when Paul was writing to a, the other churches, he put their name in the letter itself. 
And, and these three manuscripts that didn't have Ephesus in there didn't have any other name. It just had a blank space at that particular thing. And if he had, when he talked about a letter to Laodicea, it wasn't a general epistle as this is thought to be. And so I think we're still missing the letter to the Laodiceans, in my opinion. Because Ephesus was the leading city of the region and the main center of Paul's missionary activity in the area, it is understandable why later scribes might have assigned this epistle to the church at Ephesus. And there is no doubt that without question it was intended for, quote, the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus, hence it is applicable to us in this audience. The comments uh, that, that I've just read to you were by a Church of Christ preacher named Mark Copeland, and he, he's a uh, pretty strong student of the Word, and I'm usually in agreement with most everything that he writes. I looked at Burton Kaufman's comments, and he says, that in referring to that or at Ephesus, some very ancient authorities omit this phrase. The English Revised Version from 1885 has it in the margin. Um, it, it, and the ones that omitted it are the Chester Beatty Papyrus, dated at 46, uh, Papyrus 46, dated about 200 A.D. Also the phrase, as it stands, in the uh, Vatican and Sinaitic codices was apparently added by a later copyist. So there is no doubt that there is some of the manuscripts did not have this, the vast majority of them did, though. The most widely ex uh, accepted explanation, and I'm quoting from Kaufman again, of this is that some early copies left the words at Ephesus out on purpose so that other churches might insert their own names since the purpose of the writer to include all Christians everywhere is clear enough in the very next clause. Certainly nothing has been advanced to show that the claim of Ephesus as recipient ought to be surrendered in favor of any other, such as Laodicea. The Gospel Advocate commentary just accepts the recipient as the saints who are in Ephesus without going into detail about the manuscript omissions. Now with all of that said, that doesn't have any impact on the essence of the letter itself. When you think about Paul's uh, ministry in the region, Paul first uh, came to Ephesus for a short visit toward the end of the second missionary journey, and you can read about that in Acts 18, 18 and 19. Uh, Ephesus was located on the southwest coast of Asia Minor, what is now modern-day Turkey, and it was one of the great cities in that part of the world. As a Roman capital, it was a wealthy commercial center and the home of worship to the goddess Diana, which is referred to in Acts 19. The account of Paul's work at Ephesus is found in Acts 18, 19, and 20, which says he arrived in the city during his second missionary journey and though Paul briefly studied with the Jews at the local synagogue and was invited to stay longer he made plans to visit them again after a quick trip to Jerusalem and you'll read about that in Acts 18 20 and 21 on his third journey and that was in the mid 50s he did return and he found there certain disciples who undoubtedly had responded to Apollos preaching Apollos had uh, worked in Ephesus practicing only the baptism of John until Aquila and Priscilla taught him the word more accurately, and we've studied about that in previous classes. Prior to the ministry of Christ, you know, John had preached, came uh, preaching and baptizing people for the remission of sins throughout the wilderness of Judea. The baptism of John was to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. However, after the death and resurrection of Christ and the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2, the baptism of John was no longer practiced. And since Apollos had only taught 
the baptism of John in Ephesus, those who became disciples in Acts 19 had received a baptism that was no longer valid. When you go back and, and, and read about that in Acts chapter 19, you remember there were, I think, 12 disciples there who had only been baptized by the baptism of John. And to, to clarify their relationship with Christ, Paul asked the Ephesian believers, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's in the uh, first part of verse 2 of Acts chapter 19. When they answered, no, we have not even he heard whether there is a Holy Spirit, then Paul knew they had not been baptized correctly. And the baptism that was commanded by Jesus and has been practiced from Pentecost onward is in the name or by the authority of Jesus Christ and it carries the promise of the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 and verse 38. Therefore Paul commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus in Acts 19 and verse 5. I think this is an excellent example of those who having been baptized came to see that they had not understood the purpose of baptism and were thus immersed a second time for the right reason. And you may know or you may be a person who has gone through this particular thought process. It happens sometimes when, when people are baptized at a, while they're still children. Uh, you know, uh, I, some of you may have seen the movie special about John Rene, Jean Rene Ramsey's uh, death, and they were sort of pointing to her brother, brother as a potential uh, person of interest in her death. And they were highlighting the fact that he was only nine years old and how the mind goes through maturation processes and the mind changes and you know you, you you can't find I don't know if you can find any state in the United States that would take a nine-year-old and treat them as if they could think maturely enough to be held accountable for murder well you know the same could apply to uh, people who are at a very young age uh, choose to be baptized. I know we had children that could tell you the plan of salvation, even preached it on the radio at age seven, but that doesn't mean that they were mature enough to understand the ramifications of what they were doing. More applicable, applicable is the baptism that's taught in many denominational groups, where the baptism is not for the remission of sins or the baptism is not to be for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ or put you into Christ you know that that would be a baptism for the wrong reason and just like Paul baptized these people in Ephesus again people that went have been baptized for a non-scriptural reason need to be baptized again so in this way the church in Ephesus was planted Paul continued his work in Ephesus with Jews and Greeks for about three years so that the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. In other words, it was being sent out. It was not only in Ephesus, but he was teaching people and people were going out from Ephesus into the surrounding area teaching others. But following a riot that broke out in defense of the goddess Artemis, Paul left Ephesus for Macedonia, that's in Acts 20 and verse 1, but the church had been solidly planted within that three-year period. I know that uh, we have missionaries that go into Guyana and go into new areas. And when we go into a new area or when, when the gospel is preached into a new area, you know, there's not much that you can preach in maybe a week of exposure and so it's not surprising that the church that has just found out about how to become a Christian and not much more has a hard time growing until more preaching comes in. But Paul stayed with them for three years. So the fact that they would hang in there is not a surprising thing. 
On his way to Jerusalem, Paul met with the elders uh, of the Ephesian church at Miletus and delivered the moving farewell address that is recorded in Acts 20, 17, and 18. If you look at the outline, and this outline is adopted from the Bible exposition commentary, uh, it, <clears throat> certainly you got the introduction in verses 1 and 2, and then a big part of this is doctrine, our riches in Christ. That starts in verse 3 and goes through chapter 3, verse 21, dealing with our spiritual possessions in Christ, our spiritual position in Christ. Then there's a section on duty, our responsibilities in Christ, that begins in chapter 4 and goes through chapter 6, verse 20. And here we have a call to walk in unity, a call to walk in purity, a call to walk in harmony, and a call to walk in victory. And then verses 21 through 24 of chapter 6 is the conclusion. In our lesson today, I believe we should be able to get through most of, if not all, of chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, and faithful in Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He has made us accepted in the Beloved. We've studied about a lot of these greetings uh, of the prison epistle, and who is missing from this greeting but was included in the well, in most of the other prison epistles. Who's missing in this greeting? Timothy. Timothy. Now, I, you know, we've added Timothy as a prison epistle. It was written from a later prison uh, edition, but from this per first prison stay, uh, Timothy was a co-writer on all of them, except in this one, he's not identified as such. He was included in the letters to Philemon, Colossians, and Philippians. And then, as I indicated, the letter was written to him from prison as Second Timothy. Where do we find every spiritual blessing? In Christ Jesus, you know. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in the God and Father. Christ and you have a choice and I have a choice of whether I'm going to be in Christ or outside of Christ when you think about blessings and benefits of being in Christ I mean we could list a lot of those uh, certainly we are told that we're new creatures that we have forgiveness of sins that we have salvation we have eternal life and every spiritual blessings and all of those particular phrases are clearly linked to being in Christ. And remember, 
from Galatians 3.27 and from Romans 6 and verse 3 that we are baptized into Christ. There is a way that we get into Christ. We get into Christ by His blood when we have our sins washed away in baptism. What did God predestine Christians to be? All right, holy without blame and before Him in love was the answer. Let's see. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself. And what you said is also an accurate uh, manifestation of what we are when we are in Christ. But I want you to think about this term adoption. He has predestined us. You know, when a person adopts a child, it is a conscious choice. And I know it's got to be getting harder and harder to adopt children. What happens this afternoon at 2 o'clock? Life chain. Abortion is a terrible thing. And if we could, in our elders meeting this morning, I appreciate uh, Brother Buster Green praying that we would see the reversal of Roe versus Wade. You know, we need to be bold in what we're asking for. We need to stop this abortion. Just think about all of the children that might have been available for adoption if we were not murdering over a million babies per year in the United States. But God has predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself. How do the inheritance benefit of an adopted child compare to the biological child? And I wasn't supposed to stick answer up there, but I did anyway. You agree with my answer? They are the same. When, when a pe- person has chosen to adopt a child, they have brought them into the family with all of the legal rights of the biological children, including inheritance. Brother Mormon is pointing out how we are told that we become joint heirs with Christ. Here in Ephesians 1, let's look at verses 7 through 14. To Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, which He made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Because we're adopted, we've been predestined to have that inheritance that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of His glory. In Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Now that's a lot of verses. Let's go back and look at some of this. What is the mystery of His will? We studied about that a few weeks ago. What was the mystery that was hidden throughout all the ages? The gospel. And who was the gospel available to? Well, it was first only the Jews, but the mystery was that it was going to be expanded to whom? To everybody, to the Gentiles, to everybody. It's not going to be just this one special little people over there, but now it's available to everyone. For God so loved the world. All right. 
In Christ we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. The revealed mystery is that this is available to all, both Jew and Gentile. What statement of Jesus lets us know that all things both in heaven and on earth are in Christ? Now this is not in your lesson, but it ought to be in your general knowledge. All authority has been given to him in heaven and on earth. When you hear sermons about the Great Commission and they use Matthew's rendition, they will say, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You think about him giving up all that he had in heaven and coming to earth and and humbling himself to be an absolute servant to God. But now he's gone through this death and resurrection, and he has been restored to this position of greatness. When is the dispensation of the fullness of time? I heard one answer over here that said, at the end of the world. Do I hear a disagreement with that? Now is the dispensation of the fullness of time. Look at, uh, let's look there at verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And that's where that term dispensation of the fullness of time. You know, there in Matthew 28, I call your attention to the tense of the verb. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. We are in a wonderful time right now. This, All these things that were prophesied all through the... Old Testament and even into the New Testament have now been fulfilled and, and we're, we have Jesus as a Savior to all of us. What is the Christian's inheritance? Well, duh. What is the Christian's inheritance? Life eternal. All right. The hope of glory. Heaven. All right, who is the guarantee of our inheritance? The Holy Spirit. You know, when you think about what was said there in verse 13, in Him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When you think about the promise, there in Acts 2 and verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I want you to think about the importance of a seal. You know, it shows authority. Today we notarize documents so that people will know that they are valid documents. The Holy Spirit is the source of truth in the Bible. He can verify that we followed Scripture. Who better to be our authenticator than the Holy Spirit Himself? Verses 15 through 23, Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe according to the working of His mighty power. 
which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him on the right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What made it, what uh, motivated Paul to give thanks for the Ephesians? Okay. Sister Mason has indicated that it was from what he had heard about them, about their faith and about their love. Uh, it, and that's really what he said. He said, therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all saints. And then he says, do not cease to give thanks for you and make mention of you in my prayers. Wouldn't it be wonderful when people heard about us if they heard about our faith and our love for all saints and what they heard caused them to drop to their knees and give thanks for us and pray for us in our prayer, in their prayers. Now there is, uh, I don't know what I meant by writing God in that next question. It should have been Paul. What did Paul ask when he prayed for the Ephesians? Now, since I wrote the wrong thing there, I'm going to go ahead and give you my answer for that. Paul said, may, may God give you the spirit of wisdom. May he give you revelation in the knowledge of him. May your understanding be enlightened. May you know what is the hope of his calling. May you know the riches of the glory. In other words, may you know about your inheritance. And may you know the greatness of of God's power. What did God do with Christ after raising him from the dead? Set him on his right side. What did he have to sit in? Sort of hard to think about. You know, when you think about God as a spirit, uh, and, and yet when you talk about God, a lot of words are used that are physical terms, like hands of God, eyes of God, throne, those things that man can relate to. He elevated him in greatness. He raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What did Paul say about the church in verses 22 and 23? All right. Who's head of the church? Christ. And what is under Christ? The church is. All things are. Christ is head over all things to the church. And the church is the body of Christ. Next week, uh, some of you were thinking it was this week, but it's really next week. The church at North Rianzi begins a lectureship series. I'm scheduled to speak there on Sunday morning and Sunday afternoon. Uh, Brother Greg is scheduled to speak there on Wednesday night. Uh, I, can't, I do not know the names of the two speakers on Monday and Tuesday night, but in my absence on Sunday, uh, a video from World Video Bible School will be shown in this 
uh, class on the rapture. Brother Jeremy Jones is, plans on taking opening comments and then uh, showing that video. I hope that you'll uh, gain much from the study of that next week. Uh, this morning, I was uh, well pleased to find 14 inmates at the county jail wanted to worship God this morning. Um, I hope that what we're doing at the jail will have some positive impact on their lives. Thank you for your attention.